Hi everyone! If you're watching this video and you're one of my speech students, this means that you've already completed your introduction speech, so now we're going to move on to the informative speech. This speech will require a little bit more research and a little bit more structure as well. If you are one of my online students, you will be going into Module 6. This is where you can find all of your informative speech information. It's also in Module 5, and you can also find it over here in Speech Preparation Materials but you, you're most likely right here in Module 6. So we can go ahead and click into this packet. If you're not one of my online students, you have the exact same information laid out somewhere else, whether it's on Canvas or in an email I sent you, so you still have access to all the same materials. We are going to go into the PowerPoint directions. One of the first things that you probably realized um, when you're developing your speeches is that you need to consider your audience first. That is so important. You need to also figure out what the purpose of your speech is. And then pretty quickly you'll get into at least completing a rough draft outline of your speech. Right here on this first slide, I have a video called How to Write a Speech Outline by Darren LaCroix. It's pretty basic, but it does work for almost every speech. There might be a little bit more to it for other speeches in different settings, but for this particular speech in our class, it'll work pretty well. I won't play that for you guys, but play that on your own since you have access to it. In today's lecture, I'm going to be going through this breakdown. Um, you will get ready for your informative speeches by creating an introduction, your open with impact. Um, scrolling down just to give you a quick overview. You will also be talking about, or I will be talking about, the body of your speech. So that consists of some supporting materials and transitions. We will also be talking about some main points, sub points, supporting points, transitions that happen in your speech, your visual aids. This is a great video we'll talk about how your delivery impacts your speech in the audience. Your source credibility is also huge. And then lastly, we'll talk about some reminders. So going back up here, we skipped over that Darren LaCroix speech, but you can watch it on your own. He's actually a keynote speaker and a speech coach. So if you ever find yourself getting really interested in speeches, you might want to watch more of his videos. So the very first thing you do in your speech is you open with impact. And the point of doing this is to get your audience's attention. And for this particular speech, you're either going to ask the class a question or have them represent a statistic. So for instance, if you were giving a speech on autism spectrum disorder, like this student did here, you might start out by saying, raise your hand if you've ever heard about autism. What about Asperger's syndrome? Did you know that they're both part of a disorder called autism spectrum disorder? This was an actual student who gave this speech and I really loved his opening because most people have heard about autism or are vaguely familiar with Asperger's syndrome. But by asking these three questions, you start to realize you know close to nothing about autism spectrum disorder or autism. So he really piqued your interest here by asking uh, questions like this. The point of opening with impact is to help the audience relate, connect, and become interested in the topic. I do have a picture of Ross Geller from Friends here. I had to throw a Friends picture in here. And I thought this was so purposeful because this was a, a picture from the scene where he gives his first lecture at NYU. And he's nervous about being boring. So he starts speaking in a British accent because he doesn't know what else to do. You guys know now that you can open with impact, so you don't have to fake a British accent or not be yourself because now you have the key to grabbing your audience's attention right from the beginning. The next part of your introduction is your thesis statement. The thesis statement has two parts to it. The first part is your purpose, and the second part is the incentive for the audience to listen. So the student I talked about previously used this as his thesis statement. Today, I'll be talking to you all about autism spectrum disorder. And by the end of my speech, you'll be able to understand how this disorder affects individuals. So he told you what he was gonna talk about as his purpose. 
And then he said that the audience was going to gain an understanding of how this disorder affects individuals. So those are the two parts of his thesis. Moving on to the last part of your introduction, your preview statement. This is where you preview the three main points of your speech. The example this student used was the three main points I'll be speaking about today are the three disorders that fall under ASD, autism, Asperger's syndrome, and pervasive developmental disorder. So just a really quick preview so the audience knows what they're getting into. This was the student's first slide. For you guys, you will have an opening slide. This is where you have your hook slide. This student, he had asked questions in the beginning, but he also stated um, a statistic. So you can put both or either on your slide. I'm pretty flexible about it. You also do not have to cite your source on the slide, but you must cite your sources orally throughout your speech and you will need to have at least three of those. This is the student's second slide. This is his preview slide. He just very briefly lists the three main things he's going to be talking about in his speech, and he has a nice visual right there. It's nothing very complex, but it is visually appealing and helps the audience stay engaged. Moving on to the body of the speech. This is where you have your main points, you'll have some transition statements, and you'll also have your conclusion there at the end. Within your main points, and your intro and your conclusion, you will have source citations. And you will also have transitional statements or signposts. This is the same student's very first slide. So we've already seen his open with impact slide. We saw his preview slide. And this is his main point number one slide. You'll notice that he has some of his sources cited at the very top. Again, you are not required to have this, but sometimes it helps student speakers to remember that they need to give credit to the sources where they got their information. He also has a very simple heading up there and he's got his three sub points here, the definition, the symptoms, and the individual. He also added a caption which you can or you know you don't need to do but I think that may have helped him in explaining his main points. Down here we've got Asperger's syndrome, main point number two. Again, same things for his um, subpoints. He's got the definition, the symptoms, and the individual, and then he's got some supporting information under each of those. And you'll notice these pictures are from Google Images. You can use personal pictures too. Google Images is absolutely fine. You can find a lot of um, pictures that you need there. Moving on to main point number three, pervasive developmental disorder, the third main point in his speech with some source citations, a quick, easy picture from Google Images, the definition, symptoms, and the individual, just like he did with the previous main points. So moving on, just a quick uh, run through here. Here's an example from the student's outline. He's got main point one, then he's got his sub point and supporting point. I just wanted to clarify with you guys what those are. So you'll notice right here we've got main point one autism. This is his sub point. And this is his supporting point. Not that you really need to know exactly what those are called, but it does help to understand as you are preparing your outline. During your speech, you will also have transitions or signposts. For my particular class, you will use two to four of these during your speech. You must use them when moving on to a new main point. So for instance, you might have a transition between main point one and main point two, and main point two and main point three. I don't require them right after your preview, and I also don't require them going into your conclusion. What you do need to do for these transitions is clearly state the main point you just spoke about and then introduce the next main point. So the student I've been referring to throughout this lecture, one of his transitions was, now that you have a good idea of what autism is, I'll tell you about another type of ASD, Asperger's syndrome. And this is when he moved on to that second main point. The conclusion. This is your speech ending. You will restate your three main points or restate three significant facts. And then lastly, you will close with impact. It can be an authored quote. You can tie it back to the introduction. It can be thought provoking. The conclusion that the student used, the student who talked about ASD, his conclusion was, so the next time you hear someone talk about autism or you hear it mentioned on TV, 
hopefully you'll have your facts straight and you'll understand that there's more to it than meets the eye. I think this was a very simple but effective conclusion because his opening kind of showed you that you didn't know as much as you thought you did about autism or ASD. So now he said, I've informed you guys, hopefully it all will pay off. So I thought his conclusion was pretty effective there. It, it can be life-changing if you want your conclusion to just blow everyone's minds. That's awesome. You know, if you can't, that's totally understood. The big thing for me is just don't end with that's it. Please end with a solid closing statement. This is the student's very last slide, his sixth slide. And here he just um, mentioned three significant facts from his speech that he wanted the audience to remember. So we went through all six of his slides, that open with impact slide, the preview slide, then we had main point one, main point two, main point three, and now his closing slide. So you only need six. I will require you to have six slides minimum and six slides maximum because you don't need to spend all your time working on your slides. They should not be entertaining the audience. You should be entertaining the audience. They should just be a visual aid to help out. Moving on to supporting materials. For your source citations, be sure to give credit to your sources and you must have a minimum of three sources. Be sure to cite them orally during your speech and also cite them under references on your formal typed outline. APA or MLA citation is perfectly fine. An oral citation example here is, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 11 in every 1,000 children in the U.S. have been diagnosed with ASD since 2008. So that's how you might verbally say it in your speech. It's not the only way, but it's one of your options. The written citation example for the same source is right down here. So don't just give me www.blank.com. Give me more information. Tell me when it was retrieved, what the journal article was, uh, where, um, let's see what the author's name was, all the information that you can find. Please put that in the uh, written citation. Also, Google Scholar is a great place to look for sources. This is a video clip you can watch on your own. It's from the movie The Great Debaters, and it is a really powerful movie about how to kind of overcome your public speaking fears and how to kind of excel at public speaking. So for anyone who's feeling a little shaky about taking public speaking class, you might want to watch this video uh, or watch the whole movie. I think it'll help you out. The speaker in this video, when you do watch it, has great passion, great fluidity. There's actually three speakers, and they all do an excellent job. One of the speakers particularly overcomes some of her nervousness and ends up just giving a phenomenal um, speech during her debate. Think about what qualities they possess as effective speakers while you watch this, because they all have great qualities. Supporting materials, this, uh, these are your source citations and your visual aids. I'm not picky about what visual aids you want to use. If you don't have access to PowerPoint, go ahead and use Prezi or Google Slides. I don't know of any others that are available at this point, uh, but use whatever you have access to. You will follow the 6x6 or 7x7 rule as you create your PowerPoint slides. Depending on what textbook you read, the rule is either 6x6 or 7x7. Basically all that means is you need to have around six lines down and six lines going across the screen, or six words going across the screen. So essentially don't have paragraphs of text on your slides and also don't have a lot of excess white space. So this slide, I think, does a pretty good job of following the 6x6 or 7x7 rule. It's not overwhelming. That's one of the keys. You don't want to overwhelm the audience with too much text. And I also tried to throw in a picture because a picture always helps the audience to stay a little bit more engaged. So no matter what, I always try to have one picture on every slide. Do add real pictures rather than clip art. People have a harder time relating to cartoon drawings than they do to actual real people. You can also use personal and stock photos. Like I said, I used some Google or I showed you some Google images, pictures in that student's PowerPoint slides. Personal photos are also okay. If you're giving a speech about something that you've dealt with in your life, adding personal pictures actually aids your speaker credibility. So you seem more believable and you clearly have an investment in the topic 
and are passionate about it and people respect that. You can keep the PowerPoint animation simple, please. Um, some people go kind of crazy and they have things spinning and zooming and they have audio noises in between every um, slide transition. I had a student one time who had a car zooming noise every time in between the slides, every time the student transitioned. And it was so loud and so unnecessary. The speech was not about cars. Um, and it was just kind of unsettling. And the students, it always made them jump. So don't do anything distracting. It should be very purposeful and very simple. Um, keep it very basic, as basic as you can. Visual aids are to keep the audience engaged. They should not be a distraction. So that kind of goes along with keeping your animation simple. Again, Prezi can be used instead. And then physical visual aids can be used if they are not a distraction. You still need the PowerPoint, but if you really have something like a bowling ball or a Frisbee, and you wanted to show people how to use it properly when you're bowling or when you're playing Frisbee, for instance, you can do that and you can show your audience how to use it. Just don't hold it the entire time. If you're not using it, set it down. So don't carry it around with you or anything like that. I did have a student bring in um, a snake one time. It was many, many years ago and it was extremely distracting horrible, horrible situation. Everyone was fine, but um, yeah, that's, that's really a horrible distracting visual aid, so please be purposeful about that. Moving on to your delivery. Your language choice impacts your credibility, and your nonverbals say as much as your words do. So as you're speaking, you must be confident, dynamic, conversational, and well-spoken. If you tell everyone you're really excited about the speech, and you sound enthusiastic, they'll believe you. They'll believe those words coming out of your mouth. If you say, hey guys, I'm really excited to talk to you today about the best trip I ever had, that doesn't sound very enthusiastic. So you need to make sure that your nonverbals, like your confidence, like your tone, are saying just as much as um, your actual words are saying. As far as your language, goes, keep in mind your audience knowledge. Don't speak in medical jargon if you're really interested in going into the medical field and they're not. And also don't talk to them like they're five years old if it's a college classroom. You also have to keep in mind your, the, the diversity in the audience. You've got men and women, you've got people of all different backgrounds, so make sure that you craft a speech that is for everybody. If you are giving a speech about hair products, which I've had a student do that before. Don't single out the girls and completely leave out the men in the audience. Make sure you include everybody somehow. And then for your speech purpose, remember that for this speech, you are informing us. It is not an intro speech about yourself. It's not a persuasive speech to get us to act in some way. This is just a speech that will hopefully inform us about your particular topic for the future. Be conversational. Be sure that when you're speaking, you have a normal rate of speaking. Don't speak too fast or too slow. Be dynamic. That means have enthusiasm. Also, use vocal inflection, which means take advantage of the ups and downs in your voice. And be conversational. You don't want to stand up in front of your audience acting like you're reading a school paper. And you also don't want to act like you're putting on a play. I've seen both. Just be conversational. This is an extemporaneous speech, which should be well prepared, but also a little bit casual. So keep that in mind as you're preparing. For your nonverbal delivery, your gestures will enhance your message and so will continuous eye contact. So make sure that you are using purposeful movements and that you're looking around throughout the room to make eye contact with the people who are watching your speech. It really draws them in when you're trying hard to establish that connection with them. Together, your successful verbal and nonverbal delivery will help increase your credibility as a speaker. As far as your delivery goes, your pronunciation, grammar, and ums, these are things to pay very careful attention to. When it comes to pronouncing words, some people during their speech mispronounce the word and then ask audience members if that's the correct way to pronounce it. That's a horrible approach and it hurts your credibility tremendously as a speaker. So find out how to pronounce those words ahead of time. 
I usually Google pronunciations if I'm not sure, so I suggest doing the same. Use proper grammar and also cut out as many ums, you knows, likes, ands, stuff like that. Cut out as many of those as you possibly can. A little trick is if, or the more you practice, the more you practice your speech, the fewer of those non-fluencies, the fewer of those filler words will appear in your speech. So practice, develop your speech so that you know where you're headed from one idea to the next so you don't fill up that space with non-fluencies. Be sure that as you're speaking, you use gestures to emphasize your points. It helps to guide and keep the audience's attention. And also, use your gestures to point at and refer to your slides. That's a really great way to tie in your visual aid with what you're talking about and keep the audience interested. For your purposeful movement, minimize the pacing. Some people get a little too comfortable with walking, and it turns into a lot of pacing. So if you want to move, move maybe two or three times during your speech if you'd like to do some significant movements like walking across the room to stand near the other side of the audience, don't do it excessively, maybe a handful of times for you know a 10 minute speech. This is a five to seven minute speech, so if you do wanna move across the room or something, maybe do it twice. Be sure not to fidget, don't play with your hair. Some people shift their weight. And also use natural gestures. Don't put your hands in your pockets or put them behind your back. And don't fold your arms. Be sure that you're using natural gestures. A great way to practice incorporating gestures into your speech is by sitting down and practicing your speech as if it was a conversation with someone. Then continue those same gestures or maybe record them and see how you did them. And then when you stand up, try those same natural conversational gestures. The last part here is to dress so that you look like a credible speaker. Dress so that you are business casual. If you are not in my speech class, your teacher or the occasion might call for formal dress. But for this class, business casual is perfectly fine with me. But it does help establish your credibility if you're dressed very nicely. For your source credibility, this, I put a little star next to it because this is one of the most important bullet points in the entire presentation. Successful organization, content, source citations, visual aids, and delivery equals speaker credibility and a great speech. So you've got to have all of these components to pull off a fantastic speech and to establish trust with the audience to show that you are a credible speaker. For your trustworthiness, that means that you've created a relationship with the audience, show that you're competent and that you had excellent knowledge of what you were talking about, and then for your overall success, that means your content was awesome, your delivery was awesome, and then you also looked the part. Lastly, some reminders. Pick a topic you're enthusiastic about. If you're not enthusiastic about it, the class is not going to be enthusiastic about it. Practice out loud and in front of your friends for feedback. People don't like doing this, but it's the best way to figure out how to handle your nerves, and it's the best way to figure out if you're actually prepared for your speech or if you want to think that you're prepared for your speech. Practice in front of people who will be honest with you, and it's the best type of preparation for your actual presentation. Dress professionally uh, or business casual. Turn in a formal outline. If you are one of my online students, you will be turning this in, um, or you may have already turned it in actually, in module five, and that needed to be typed um, as an outline with your references at the very bottom. And for my face-to-face -face students, you guys will be turning that in on your speech day. You'll be printing it out and turning it in. Bring extra note cards to evaluate your peers. That means maybe 30 note cards um, during speech day. If you're an online student, don't worry about this. You won't be doing this. If you're face-to-face, -face, bring as many note cards um, as you think is appropriate for evaluating each peer who will be speaking that day. Normally, we have about seven or so people. You also might want to bring extra note cards for yourself uh, in case you spill something on one or you lose one or you want to add another one. So bringing extra note cards is just a good idea. And sadly, this next part, I don't do this anymore. If you record yourself and put it on YouTube, you get extra credit. Sorry, you can put it on YouTube and tell me about it and I will be really happy for you and very supportive and you'll get brownie points, but sorry, I'm not giving extra credit for that anymore. 
And then lastly, plan for time. You have five to seven minutes. So keep that in mind. This is really a big thing. Sometimes people's speeches end up going 10 minutes and they haven't even gotten to main point number three. So make sure that you plan for time. As you practice your speech, have a timer every single time so that you know where you fall within that five to seven minutes so that you don't lose any points. If you go 15 seconds, for, or for every 15 seconds under five minutes, um, you lose one point, and for every 15 seconds over seven minutes, you lose one point. And that does add up, especially when you're getting to nine, ten minutes, or if you're under a few minutes. So time is so important. That is it for our presentation. I hope you guys feel a little bit more prepared now, and don't hesitate to email me if you have any additional questions. Bye.